this unit is about principal component analysis, which is maybe the most frequently used statistical tool for analysis of data, in particular high dimensional data across many disciplines in science. Many of you probably already know PCA, so this will just be a brief recap for you. But in the context of this lecture, PCA is relevant because it's a latent variable model that is deterministic and linear. So it's one of the most fundamental um, approaches to data analysis and dimensionality reduction and visualization. So let's first talk about notation. We consider X, bolts face X as a data set, and we're gonna use a matrix to represent a data set, where in each matrix row, we have a vector um, such that a data matrix has N rows, one row per data point and D columns where the columns are the dimension of the data space. So it's a R to the power of N times D matrix. Then let C similarly be a matrix, but this is a matrix now corresponding to the latent variables where in each row, again, we store a vector, but now it's a latent code. This matrix also has N rows, but it has fewer columns. It has just Q columns instead of D columns. Maybe Q is three or two is a small number. Now, while X is observed, C is unobserved. The latent variable is unobserved and needs to be inferred from X alone. Typically, we assume Q to be smaller than D because we want the model to yield a compressed representation. And we'll see examples of this. In PCA, our goal is to learn a bidirectional mapping such that we have both an encoder and a decoder. And as such, it's an autoencoder model. So we want to have a mapping from the latent space C to the observation space X and from the observation space X back to the latent space C. And we want to have that mapping such that as much information as possible of X of this high dimensional space is retained in C. For instance, if we think about images, MNIST digits, we have a 700 dimensional uh, latent space, uh, 700 dimensional observation space because we flattened the images into vectors just as we did for the MLP exercise. So here we would have 700 columns and then we want to reduce that dimensionality to maybe just two or three. So Q is just two or three. In other words, we want to encode X into a latent code C such that if we decode C back into X hat, where X is the reconstruction, then this reconstruction is a good approximation to the original X that we had observed or encoded. And in most cases, X hat is not equal to X because we don't find a perfect mapping that perfectly maps in both direction. Compression is always a, a lossy process for real data sets. So let's assume now the following linear mapping from a latent space to the observation space. We have the prediction x hat. This is now a vector. This is one of these, oops, this is one of these prediction vectors. Now this is like this is a vector in that data set. X is the input and x hat would be the, the prediction. So the prediction vector is equal to the mean x bar is the mean plus a linear combination of basis vectors v and we have a c this is a matrix uh, the matrix of latent variable c where we index into the ith row and the jth column so for every you see this the sum runs over from j equal one to q because we have q columns in that c matrix so each row in that c matrix 
contains one of these latent vectors, where each element of these latent vectors encodes the coefficient that we multiply with the with this basis vector v in order to reconstruct x hat. And we assume that we have this, this offset to be the mean and the um, basis to be an orthonormal basis. Why do we do that? Well, the mean is already um, the best reconstruction if we don't know anything, if we don't use any latent dimensionality of the data. The mean is the best we can predict if we don't have any latent uh, code or latent dimensionality. So x, x bar, the mean, is already is a good starting point. That's where we want to center our coordinate system on. That makes sense. And then, um, so that also makes mathematically it makes sense, but we're not going to derive it here, but that's the best approximation if we don't have any, if we have a q equals zero, no latent dimensionality, uh, latent dimensionality be zero. Now, if we allow to have a basis that's uh, one or two or three dimensional, then we add these coefficients times the basis vectors. And we choose an autonomal basis because that spans our space well. There's other techniques that use a non-autonomal basis, but in the context of PCA, we assume an autonomal basis. That's a canonical basis, a canonical coordinate system, you can think, that you put, um, that you center at x bar at the mean, and that spans your data space, and it should um, be oriented in a way that it explains the data set as much as possible. Now our goal with this model is to minimize the L2 reconstruction loss with, respe with respect to the latent variable C and the autonomal basis V. So we write this as the loss of C and V is over all the data points, the sum of the prediction this um, uh, expression here minus the or the reconstruction is called the reconstruction minus the input the original input right okay um, and and here on the right hand side this is just uh, uh, I've just plugged in x hat um, here and I obtained this expression. So this is the objective that we want to minimize, and we ask, well, what is C and what is V? Now, considering that we have assumed that V is an autonomal basis that spans the space well, we expand the loss functions as follows. This is the loss function from the previous slide. Now, um, we can, of course, um, pull that term inside that sum here, so we get this expression here, right? So we haven't changed anything, we just pulled this in. And now um, what we have here is a quadratic expression. Um, so what that means is we have um, the first term squared plus two times the first term times the second term, this is the second term here, um, times the second term squared. This is what I've written down here. And there's one more thing that has happened here, which is that if I take the square of this first term, because V is an orthonormal basis, and if I take um, Vj to the power of two, um, then um, I obtain one. So that, that Vj vanishes here, and I'm left with Cij to the power of two. Okay, now this is the expression from the previous slide. And if we now want to minimize that expression with respect to x, what we have to do um, is we, uh, well, um, yeah, sorry, with respect to c, what we have to do is we simply have to set the derivative of this, ex of this loss function with respect to c to zero. If we take the deriv derivative of this with respect to c i j, then this last term vanishes because it doesn't depend on c. 
and then all of these sums here vanish as well because we are only picking out one element which is depending on cij and that is 2 times cij this is the first one and then we have 2 times vj transpose x bar minus xi and that expression must be equal to zero and that can be minimized in closed form right so we have a closed form expression for this which is the optimal solution is cij star we put a star here to denote that this is the optimum is uh, minus vj transpose x bar minus xi okay now if we take that expression and and plug it in back into this loss formulation then we obtain the loss at the optimal value for c the loss at c equals c star and that simplifies now um, the last term is unchanged um, but here in uh, for the first term we have um, uh, we have uh, two times this expression so we have minus um, c i j star squared um, and 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 the sum runs over j equal one to q right, so we have c i j squared minus two c i j squared so we obtain minus c i j squared so this is the expression that is that is left if we assume that c is equal to c star now um, we have only optimized with respect to c star uh, with respect to c so far now we also need to optimize with respect to v now the reconstruction loss from the previous slide at c star ij can be slightly rewritten so we take this expression here and we plug in the optimal value we plug in this this equation into here we see that this is the same as having the sum over j equals 1 to q vj transpose svj where s is the so-called scatter matrix that is the unnormalized sample covariance matrix of x which collects from the entire data set i equals 1 to n um, the uh, the outer product of x bar minus x i with itself and why is that well if you plug that c i j star into here you see that you have this expression twice so you can then because this is a scalar um, you can also plug in the transpose of that and so um, the uh, the second term um, like the right multiplier here um, turns around so we have x bar minus x i times v j a transpose times v j here and then um, uh, vj does not depend on the index i it just depends on the index j and that means that we can pull the sum i equals one to n um, through this expression through j and so we have this inner we are left with this inner term here which is exactly the scatter matrix that i've written down here okay now, if we want to optimize with respect to V, now this expression, then uh, we need to insert an additional constraint to avoid a trivial solution. And what we insert as an additional constraint is because we have assumed that V is an autonormal basis, we know that the length of each of these basis vectors must be equal to one. So we integrate that constraint into our loss function by adding a so-called Lagrange multiplier. If you're familiar with optimization, you've heard about Lagrangians before. It's basically a simple trick to make sure that if I compute the derivative of this with respect to now these new variables, they are added to the loss term, to the dependency of the loss term here. If I'm adding these new variables and optimizing with respect to those as well, if I take the gradient with respect to lambda, then uh, and set that to zero then i obtain exactly my constraint if you see look at the right hand side here 
if I take of this expression, I take the gradient with respect to lambda j, um, I obtain exactly vj transpose vj um, minus one must be um, minimal, must be must be close to zero. That's in a nutshell what Lagrange multipliers do. We add another variable in order to introduce a constraint into the optimization problem. This variable is, is lambda here, lambda, boldface lambda, is a vector that collects all the elements lambda j. Now, if we take that expression and we compute the derivative of this expression with respect to vj, we obtain, so now we, we compute, um, we want to compute the derivative with respect to vj and set it to zero in order to optimize, or find the optimum with respect to vj. If we do that, um, we see that we have um, minus two s vj from the first expression. This term here vanishes and here we have two lambda j vj because we have this quadratic term here. So we're left with a linear term in v. And we see that if we set this now to zero, we obtain a very familiar equation. That's precisely the equation of an eigenvalue problem. And so we see that lambda and v now are the solution to this eigenvalue problem where we decompose the matrix S, the scatter matrix, um, into a uh, eigenvector basis. So this is exactly an eigenvalue problem. And we know how to solve eigenvalue problems. We have good um, algorithms for, for doing that. So we can just use these algorithms for solving this. What we also observe is that as we have vj transpose svj, um, this expression here, equal to, because this holds, equal to lambda j vj transpose vj, and because vj transpose vj is one, as the basis vectors are normalized, the length is one, this is equal to lambda j, we see that this loss here is minimized by choosing for this um, basis matrix V, the eigenvectors Vj of S that correspond to the largest Q eigenvalues. So we sort the eigenvalues, uh, start with the largest one, and that explains most of the data. And then we take the next one until we reach Q, which is the dimensionality of the latent space. And we stack all of these vectors into as columns into the matrix, into this basis matrix V. Okay. Now, this is the result that we obtain by this. We have our linear model from the very first slide. And we have now obtained this um, matrix V where um, we have the columns of this matrix to be the eigenvectors corresponding to the top eigenvalues, the largest eigenvalues of the scatter matrix S. And so we can write uh, very compactly for PCA, the decoder and the encoder as simple linear mappings. For instance, the decoder, this is exactly this expression here is we are mapping a latent code through a um, linear map V and add this bias term, the mean of the data set to it, and we obtain x. This is exactly this expression. And then we can also do the opposite. We can, um, we can bring x bar to the other side. So we have x minus x bar, and then we um, bring also v to the other side. So we have retranspose x minus x bar. And this is our encoder that brings us from yields the mapping from X to C. So we have both the decoder that maps from C to X and the encoder that maps from X to C. This is it, basically. Here is the PCA model. Um, in this illustration, I've just shown the basis um, vectors V in the matrix notation V. I haven't uh, shown the mean 
vector x here for simplicity. But of course, it's part of this transformation from x to z and z to x, as I've shown on the previous slide. And uh, this is the formulation that we have uh, used. We have minimized the reconstruction error, the L2 error. And the PCA principle, the PCA recipe is then very simple. Given a data set x with uh, n data points, we first compute the data mean and the scatter matrix S. And then we compute the eigen decomposition of S and select the Q eigenvectors corresponding to the Q largest eigenvalues to assemble V. And then we simply have this decoder and encoder as these very simple linear mappings to map between the two spaces. And this is what it looks like. Um, so here is this 2D data set again that we had in the beginning. And uh, what I show here is the these arrows indicate, first of all, here in the center, this is the mean of the data set. This is X bar, where this coordinate system is centered. And the arrows then indicate the um, two eigenvectors that have been found by PCA scaled by the square root of lambda of the normalized scatter matrix of the empirical covariance matrix, such that we have the length roughly corresponding to the um, standard deviation in that direction. And you can see that this vector here is longer. So this has a larger eigenvalue and this vector here is smaller. So it has a smaller eigenvalue. The variance in this direction is smaller. The variance in this direction is largest. And if we assume now a one-dimensional latent space, what that means is we map all the data points onto that vector, that first, that largest vector. This is what indicated here with this line. This is the mapping that we do. And then we reconstruct the yellow points and we minimize the reconstruction error. And this is exactly giving us the solution um, that we've derived. Now, there's two different perspectives on PCA. We have saw that PCA can be motivated by minimizing the L2 reconstruction error. However, we can also motivate PCA by maximizing precisely the variance of the latent points as we've already indicated here. This vector here corresponds to the direction of the largest variance. In other words, we like to find an embedding that captures most of the variation in the original data set captures most of the variance while using uh, a smaller dimensionality, Q. And to see this also mathematically, it's not very hard. We consider the following one-dimensional encoding of a vector X. Now this is one basis vector that we project onto and we have our equation from before. This is exactly the same, just um, V is not a matrix, but it's just a vector. We are projecting onto a one-dimensional space as in, in this example here, we are projecting onto a one-dimensional space. Now, if we consider this one-dimensional encoding, um, our goal now is to maximize the variance in the latent space. It's no longer minimizing the squared reconstruction error, but it's to maximize the variance in the latent space. So we write the variance of C, the random variable here is X, but C depends on X is the expectation of, well, C minus the expectation of C and, and uh, the whole expression squared. This is just the definition of the variance. And I um, plugged in uh, C here, this expression here for C. Now, here on the right hand side, we see that we can, um, because the expectation is a linear operator, we can pull that expectation through this uh, vector here. And so we have the expectation and, and X bar is not a stochastic quantity either. So we have the expectation of, this is the expectation with respect to X. So we have the expectation of X, which is exactly X bar. So we have X bar minus X bar. So this term vanishes. So we're left with um, this expression squared. Now this expression squared is this expression. The only thing I did here is I, I swapped X bar and X um, because if I swap at both sides, then it doesn't change the sign. 
And now we can see that this expectation here is exactly um, v transpose as v as this is the um, normalized scatter matrix. So we have a, a proportional sign here because we didn't normalize. The normalized scatter matrix would be the scatter matrix times one over n. We normalize with respect to the number of the data points. And this is what this expectation here would do. So this is only proportional, but the optimization problem is of course the same, no matter what the constant is. Uh, but just to explain why we have this proportionality here. So this is exactly what we had seen before, V transpose S V. Now let us again assume an orthonormal basis V, V1 to VQ of dimension Q, but we now wanna maximize the sum of variance along each dimension subject to the normalization constraints that we had before. And this of course leads uh, then to a very similar problem, the problem that we are already familiar with. So we have now this optimization problem where we wanna maximize with respect to lambda and v, this expression here. Again, we have the Lagrange multiplier to accommodate the constraint that v is normalized or must be normalized. It's an autonormal basis and here uh, in the first expression, we have the maximization of the variance that we saw on the previous slide. And this is exactly the same expression that we had before. And we know already that the solution to this is given by the Q largest um, eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors of S. As a little remark, um, Vj transpose S Vj is the variance along the J principal component if the scatter matrix S is normalized by the number of data points. In other words, if it's a, an uh, empirical uh, covariance matrix, it's an empirical approximation to the covariance matrix. Okay, so this was a lot of math. Let's look at some examples. This is the example that we've already seen. We have a data set, a 2D data set with 20 blue points in two dimensional space. And we assume a one dimensional latent space. So Q is one. And what we see here is the two eigenvectors that um, correspond to the eigenvectors of the scatter matrix S. And they are scaled by the standard deviation. Now, what does the latent space actually look like? Here we see only the original data points and the reconstructions. So in this plot here, I have actually visualized all the free quantities. So we have X on the left, we have C here in the middle, and we have the reconstruction X hat on the right. And we have it for two cases. The first row is with a one dimensional latent space. And the second row is PCA with a two dimensional latent space one-dimensional latent space on the top, two-dimensional latent space on the bottom. Of course, it's the same data set here. So the um, eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue is the same in both. But the difference is that here we have just one eigenvector. So we project only to this space and here we have two. In the first row, this therefore yields a one-dimensional latent space. So all the points are on a line. There is no second dimension. I just used the same plot here to visualize it. We have just C. And then if we map backwards um, with the linear map, then um, we obtain this reconstruction, which is exactly what we had before here. So this is the input, the observations. This is the projection into the latent space, and this is the reconstruction. If we do the same thing for a two-dimensional latent space, then what we see is that, well, the, two, the latent space is two-dimensional and we have some, um, some stretching of the points going on. So there's some normalization going on here. And then we have the mapping back into the uh, two-dimensional observation space. And in this case, the points are the same. So the reconstruction error can be minimized to zero, which is um, obvious. Uh, because we haven't introduced any compression. It's a, it's a model that's not very useful. It's a model which, which you can figure out what, um, how you, your um, 
how large your variance is in each dimension, but it's not a model that that exploits the regular regular structure of your data set. That in this case, the data set is there's kind of a manifold along this direction of the largest eigenvector, and that can be exploited to compress the data. This is a, a very simple 2D illustration of what happens also in higher dimensional spaces, where we're looking for manifolds of very high dimensional image spaces, like in MNIST of 700 dimensional image spaces. This is an example with MNIST. Here we have a, a data set and we have different reconstructions with a different number of bases. So if you have just two bases, we get a very blurry reconstruction. But then if we increase the number of bases here, in this case 506, we have a much more detailed reconstruction, but we need a lot of bases for such a linear type of model. Here on the bottom, we have the mean, which is very similar to the reconstruction with two bases. And we also see the principal components where you can see what transformations are learned. In, in the first case here, for example, the digit is slightly rotated and stretched. And here we have a translation. Um, and here we have kind of a, a scaling. So these are the most dominant transformations that the algorithm has learned automatically from the data and that are used to compactly with just few dimensions few latent dimensions represent the data. Um, so this was an MNIST. Now, PCA can be also applied to face images. If they are well curated, they are all cropped to the same size. They look very similar, but then you can get pretty good reconstructions with only three components as shown here. And then also what we can do is we can take this PCA, this low dimensional space, this low dimensional embedding of each of the data points. And if there's a a test image arrives, we can then classify in that latent space. So we can take our training set and train a classifier in a latent space and then um, apply the same transformation to the test samples and classify. And this is of course very efficient um, because we have a much smaller dimensional space so we can um, build more um, potentially more powerful classifiers um, that with a small number of data generalize very well. And uh, for, for this example here, there are there are some numbers. So PCA with three components obtains 79% accuracy on, on this phase non-phase discrimination, while a Gaussian mixture model um, with 84 states uh, provides uh, even slightly lower performance. And here, finally, there's a visualization of what's called the eigenphases. These are the eigenvectors then rearranged, reshaped again into a image matrix and you can see also here um, what changes you can see that there is some some illumination changes and some some low frequency changes that are learned in the first components of this um, uh, of this uh, eigenvector space and then if we go to um, to the less important components we see that there is more high frequency details that are modified.